Hello and welcome back to Dr. Logic Awkwardly Does Logic in her office, this time with bonus awkwardness, because I'm going to try using the whiteboard facilities to start presenting you some of the details. Now, last time, I promised you that we would start doing real, actual, proper logic, and I'll give you the definitions necessary to get going with the Aristotelian syllogistic. I'm sorry, I may have lied a tiny bit. We are going to get there, I promise you, but first I'm going to give you a couple of preliminaries. This video is all about what logicians like to do best, namely define things and make distinctions. So let me share with you my whiteboard. Now, hopefully you will be able to see that, possibly you may still be able to see me, but the important thing is what's gonna be going on on what I've got. The first definition or distinction that we need to make has to do with terms. So you remember I said last time that terms are the building blocks of the syllogistic, but there are multiple different kinds of terms and the most important ones that we have are, there we go, look at that. Categorimatic terms versus thin categorimatic. The so category. Oops. There you go. Categorimatic terms are terms that have meaning in isolation on their own, apart from any other terms. So if you like grammar, these are going to be things like nouns, adjectives, verbs. So Fred, cat mammal, white, running, or is running, things like this. The thin categorimatic ones are basically all of the other sorts of words, words that you can't really explain what they mean without having some kind of context that they go. So prepositions, quantifiers, negation, conjunction. All of these sorts of things are sin categorimatic. Later on, we will talk about a distinction between the logical vocabulary of the language and the non-logical. And it will turn out to be the case that the logical vocabulary of a language generally tends to be the sin categorimatic terms and the non-logical are the categorimatic. So just keep this in mind for the future. The categorimatic ones are our focus. These are the sorts of things that we want to be able to say things about in the context of the syllogistic. So with an understanding of what these are, clear, clear, ooh, look at that, I've got a blank whiteboard. We're also going to introduce a particular type of syn categorimatic term that we will use to combine the categorimatic ones together. So here we have a, definition of the notion of copula. So a copula is an operator that combines two categorimatic terms. Now it's not just any operator, it's actually going to be one of the following. So we have the copula belongs to every, belongs to none, belongs to some, and doesn't belong to some. These are the, there we go. These are the relationships between terms that we are interested in in the syllogism. Now, there are plenty of other relationships that terms can have, but we'll set those aside. They're not what we're interested in right now. We're interested in these. So this allows us, if we've got categorimatic terms on the one hand, syn categorimatic terms on the other hand, this allows us to combine them in together into particular types of propositions. So here we have another definition, and this is the definition of a categorical proposition. So you might 
you might recognize that there's this relationship between categorical and categorical. Yes, this is not accidental. A categorical proposition is basically take two terms, categorical terms, and plug them on either side of one of the copulae. So let, um, I'm just going to use X and Y because it's easier to, uh, easier to write. So we can have X belongs to every Y, or we can have X belongs to no Y, or X belongs to some Y, or X doesn't belong to some Y. So these are to some these are the types of sentences that we can that we will eventually be able to say in the language of the syllogistic. Right now, what we've got is kind of this hybrid language. Some of it's written in English, but I've got these X's and Y's in to stand for arbitrary terms. But what we are interested in doing is developing a symbolic representation of these English language sentences. So this is kind of like a, a hybrid translation, part of the way there. I'm going to introduce a little bit of notation now just to kind of give you a way of referring to these different types of categorical propositions. We'll say more about them um, in the next video probably, but for now, I'm just going to give them labels. So I'm going to call that first one an A proposition. The second one is an E proposition. This one is an I proposition. And this one is an O proposition. So you don't have to memorize these at this point. I will keep coming back and talking to them and giving you uh, reminders of what these are. But just to know that we have four different types of categorical propositions and these are the way that we, we refer to them. Now, already we can start to see how you would go from English into a formal system. So I'm going to clear that, excellent and give you an example of this. So consider the argument that uh, all mammals are animals, all cats are mammals, Therefore, here I'm just going to draw a line. It's got the premises on the top, the conclusion on the bottom. From here, we will conclude that all cats are animals. So this is a good argument. And I will make this explicit once we actually discuss how to um, formally define the notion of goodness of a syllogism. But just so that you're not confused, this is a good argument. We can start by identifying all of the categorical terms. So we've got three of them. We've got mammals here, that's a categorical term. And then we have animals, that's another one. And then we have, we have cats. Now, all and R are sin categorical terms. But this doesn't look, none of these sentences look like the ones that we had on the previous whiteboard where we were talking about thinking, things belonging to other things. So if this is, say, step one, then step two is to get from this natural English language sounding statements into the slightly weird but still English sentences that I had on the previous screen. So what we can say is that the term animal belongs to all mammals. It's a property that all mammals have. And we can also say that mammal belongs to all cats. Conclusion, animal belongs to all cats. So this is the same argument as the previous one. It's just 
kind of represented in a different way, but still in English. You might notice, and this is the, the crucial thing to notice, is that the relative order of the terms has swapped from the ordinary English to the kind of weird, slightly formal English that we have. Now, I'm gonna give you just a little bit more grammar. From the point of view of grammar, we have the subject and the predicate. So what we have here is that the predicate actually comes first and the subject comes second. Just kind of keep this in the background. Now, given how we represented on the previous, uh, the, the previous screen, we just had these X's and Y's. Well, maybe we could represent our subject and predicate terms, our categorimatic terms in this way now. So next step, I'm just gonna take A for animal, M for mammal and C for cat. So nice and mnemonic. So we could represent this argument as A belongs to all M. M belongs to all C. Therefore, A belongs to all C. So now we are getting something which is kind of like half English, half symbolic. And this is where the fact that we introduced those shorthands for the two categorical, uh, for four categorical propositions comes into play. So we can do one more sort of translation step to get a fourth form of argument by recognizing that each one of these is a belongs to all proposition. So why write that out when I could just say that animal belongs to all mammal, mammal belongs to all cat, therefore animal belongs to all cat. And look at that, we have gone from a completely English language argument to something that is completely symbols and abbreviations. Making that explicit, and how we do it, and what's going to, how we can combine these letters, what letters we use, what are the requirements, what are the permissions for how to make these combinations, is what we will get, I promise, in the next video where we formally define the language for the syllogism. So I will stop sharing, and then I will say thank you and goodbye. See you next time. Cheers.